It's lovely to see you again, Abby Anka. We've uh, encountered each other. We've never actually met each other properly, but we have on a couple of occasions now, if not more, um, been with each other on Zoom. So, uh, yeah. Um, anyway, um, to, let, let's go right back to the beginning, if we may. Um, I think you told me that you, uh, you were born in Zimbabwe. Um, and can you say just a bit about where you were born and, yeah. So I was originally born in Zimbabwe in a place called Bulawayo and I spent a couple of years there with my mum for a short period of time and then the rest of my family before my mum came to the UK. So you probably won't remember too much of Bulawayo or of, uh, of uh, Zimbabwe but um, I have been to Zimbabwe and spent uh, some days there um, and the place I spent most time in was not far from Bulawayo, on the road between there and um, the Victoria Falls at a, a place um, called St James's Mission, which is really a, a mission house and a school. And, um, and it uh, was a place called Niemantlovu, which I think means place of elephant meat. <laughs> Good name. But you lived in Bulawayo itself. Yes, I lived in Blue itself and, uh, you know, with my large family because the Maconis are quite, it's a huge, huge family. So, yeah, I lived there for quite a long time. Um, but I did travel uh, across the country to visit other family members to Harare right. and Chipinga. In Harare, yeah. Yeah, well, I, I came through Harare. Indeed, I can never forget being at the, in the, uh, the carousel where you pick your case up after the flight. And someone called out Stephen, and I ignored it, since I didn't think I knew anyone in Harare. And then it called again, and it was a friend of mine who actually lives in um, uh, Taiwan, and who happened to be coming through Zimbabwe at the very same moment as me. <laughs> Amazing, isn't it? So, and tell me, you probably won't remember, but the thing I remember about Bulawayo is the wonderful trees down the main street, which had a, a light blue blossom. I can't remember what they're called, but when I was there, they were all in bloom. It was quite beautiful. But do you, have you been back to um, Zimbabwe since you left? I went back when I was, I think about 12 years old. So quite a few years ago uh, to go and visit family. And I think I just fell in love with the country all over again. You know, I hadn't been back for quite a while. So I was able to see my family members uh, my cousins, and it was just a great time. Lovely country. Huge, hugely attractive country, isn't it? And potentially a very productive one. I agree. I definitely agree. And the people and just the food everywhere. You can just pick fruit from trees just like that. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So then you came over. But you, so you, you, you followed your mother. Your mother had come over before you. Yes, so my yeah. mom had uh, come over before me just to, you know, go to uni and make a life for herself before she brought me over. So she studied radiography. Did she? In London? Uh, yeah, in London at City. Yeah. At City, right. Yes, OK. And is that attached to um, um, Queen Mary Hospital or to uh, one of the other big hospitals? Well, yeah, she's at uh, King George, so, well, now she's a sonographer, but she started off as a radiographer, yeah. Right. Where, where, where is she now in, working in London still? Yeah, still working here in London. Yeah, still working. Okay, now then, when you, you went to school locally in Raynham, but then you went on to Sixth Form College at, um, in Harold Hill, um, and... It's, is it called the Draper's College or the Draper's Academy? It's or? called the Draper's Sixth Form, yeah. Right. Draper's Academy Form, yeah. And can you just say a little bit more about that? Because it sounds a bit like a livery company. It is, and I didn't actually realise until after a long time. But yeah, the Draper's Academy uh, is quite a fairly new school, um, Sixth Form actually. Um, they always had a secondary school, but I think the Sixth Form's it's just eight years old. But it's it's a great school. It obviously works with the Draper's Hall. So we did have a few events at that hall where we would go there for careers advice on CVs and so forth. 
So you'll know Draper's Hall a bit. <laughs> yes, yes, I do, yeah. Yes, it's quite a grand building too, isn't it? I agree. It's definitely beautiful, yeah. Yes, yes. I knew that because a church I looked after for three years, the people who um, were the, uh, I suppose you might say the sponsors almost, the people who appointed were the Draper's Company. So I did quite a lot with the Draper's Company. Okay, and then while you were there, tell us a bit about what really was the thing that got you most interested um, towards the end of your school career? Interested in journalism or? Yes, really, yes. Um, well, the truth is I hadn't always known that I wanted to be a journalist. Um, however, in secondary school, um, age 15, I did start a print magazine. And that was mainly because I felt as if you know, the youth of Le East L London needed a platform essentially to uh, express their views and discuss some of the issues we were seeing around us as young people. And also just to promote some of the positive things that we're doing. Um, but that magazine was just a hobby. My mind was set on, you know, being a radiographer just like my mother, because that's what I was exposed to and that's what I knew. Um, journalism seemed so far-fetched for me at the time, but I continued this magazine for a while. Uh, it gained momentum and I guess popularity from a lot of the young people around me, but yet the idea of being a writer just it, it just didn't seem like it's something I could actually do for a living until I got to sixth form um, and I was in my second year of the magazine. We had done uh, I think it was the second issue and my head of sixth form said to me Avianka I know you're studying biology chemistry and all these other subjects but it seems that you you're more passionate about this magazine you know have you ever thought about journalism have you ever thought about taking this further uh, and quite a while for quite a while I hadn't um, unfortunately unfortunately until the death of my friend uh, due to knife crime where that's when I started I guess you could say really looking into community issues and how they're covered uh, in mainstream media. And that's when I started reading more of the Evening Standard, The Guardian, ITV and so forth. And really looking at how uh, the media covers community affairs in certain communities. And I think his death and of course the encouragement of my teachers made me realize that actually this is an industry I would like to get into and really focus on telling stories at the heart of communities and interviewing marginalized groups. That's a great story it really is a great story and um, who uh, when you started this mag you started the magazine? Yes. Yeah and it, it, where could people get it in your school or in any of the schools or so I self-funded the magazine, so they would have to go directly through me. Um, so it was definitely tough running a magazine on my own. I was always <laughs> using pocket money and lunch money to actually pay the printers. But uh, if anyone wanted to get the magazine, they would go through me, whether that's via social media. And I had a little website as well that they could order from. And then I was working with the printing company to ensure they deliver it to the right people. I just think that's amazing. Okay, so, right, so you then became sort of fired up by um, talking to people at the, in the sixth form about journalism, and um, what happened then? How, how did you actually get into journalism? So I just started emailing a whole bunch of people because I knew how competitive the industry was. I, I started, you know, reading a lot of interviews done by journalists that um, inspire me and they emphasize how difficult of an industry it is so I just started emailing journalists from across the UK just saying hi this is who I am I really love your advice and can you you know spare the time and speak to me and thankfully quite a few people did get back to me and they would spend you know, an hour or so just telling me about their own journey and some of the mistakes they may have made as well um, just to ensure that I don't make the same mistakes and one journalist was kind enough to actually invite me to her newsroom and she gave me a tour. And I think that's when the idea of becoming a journalist became very real because I thought, wow, you know, I finally seen what a newsroom looks like. Perhaps I can actually do this. Um, so that was the first step, reaching out to those much more experienced than I and just really getting their guidance and advice. Um, and once I felt I had all the information, I sat down with my sixth form teacher and I said, look, 
you know, ex work experience is really crucial. So I would love to have, you know, a week or so off to be able to do some work experience if that's possible. Yeah. That's, uh, I just think it's amazing. It shows some huge spirit in you and huge energy. You, you were clearly quite clear what you, you knew what you wanted to do. So um, how did you actually then end up with your first job in journalism? Mm -hmm. Well, I had to, before any of that, I did have to convince my mother to actually, I guess, give me the blessing of be, getting into journalism because, of course, all my life I had said, yes, I'm going to be a radiographer or yes, I'm going to get into healthcare. And then now all of a sudden I had changed and said, I'm going to be a journalist. So I think it was definitely a hard pill to swallow for a lot of people. Um, but they basically sat me down and said, OK, if you're going to do this, you need to do this properly. Um, and I think for my first job, it came about in a bit of a crazy way, really. I was set on going to university, um, so apprenticeship wasn't on the forefront of my mind. So I was just doing a lot of work experience to ensure that I could get a university place. But I didn't realise that all that work experience I was doing would lead me to be able to get an apprenticeship. So after my A-levels... After my A-levels, I was just looking around on social media for different opportunities or different, you know, jobs that I could apply for. And thankfully, I had managed to, uh, sorry, thankfully, I was already following someone who was a former apprentice at the Evening Standard who said, oh, the Evening Standard are looking for uh, a junior news reporter. If anyone's interested, please DM me. And at first, I thought I wouldn't be qualified enough to apply for it, but uh, with the encouragement of my sixth form, they said, look, you've been doing lots of work experience these past two years, just apply and see where it gets you. And I applied and put my heart and soul into the interview, even brought my magazines along. And thankfully, I got the, the job role. I'm not surprised. <laughs> I'm sure that you must have been uh, yeah, marvellous at sort of um, showing them what, what you could um, offer them in the future. It's, it's a very, very good story. Tell me about... I love your name, Abby Anker. Now, where is that from? Do you know what? That's such a good question. I always ask my mother and she says that my father wanted me to be named Bianca, but then she wanted Abby or the other way around. And they just couldn't, you know, get to an agreement until she just said, you know what? Why don't we just do Abby Anker? That's what, that's the story basically that I've been told. They just put the two names that they wanted together and then formed Abby Anker. It's a great name, and I, I, it's, I can imagine you. Lots of people ask because my wife uh, is called Rosalie, R O S L I E, and everyone always says, "Oh, you mean Rosalie, or you know, whatever." <laughs> but they didn't. Her parents didn't want to call her uh, exactly that, and they decided on that name. So it sounds just, just the same. And was your father also from Zimbabwe, or was he from elsewhere? Yes, he was also from Zimbabwe. Yes. Right. So Maconi is a is a local name. Yeah, um, Makoni is uh, quite, quite well known in Zimbabwe because of our history and our chiefs and so forth, yeah. And your? Um, your Chief Makoni uh, from many years ago, so yeah. Ah, uh, right, yes, okay. And um, that's the, the southern part of, um, uh, of Zimbabwe was particularly, uh, do I mean Matabili country, Ndebele country or? Yeah. Is that right? Yeah. yeah, 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 yeah. Whereas the north is uh, um, Shona, is that right? Shona. The Shona, yeah, mm -hmm. yes, yes, yes. I remember landing in Zimbabwe, just looking out over the countryside, and I was in trance from the very first moment. Um, and then after that, uh, how? who suggested you might become a stationer, an apprentice? Just during a debate, I did a stationer's hall on diversity and the younger generation, Gen, Gen Z. And I think it was one of the senior Freemans that had spoken to Doug about potentially becoming a uh, Freeman. And Doug, of course, was already a stationer himself. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yes. So, yeah, and it's good because we're beginning to um, build up a little sort of group of young stationers. Um, are you part of the Young Stationers as well, or not yet? Yes, I'm part of the Young Stationers. They oh. are group and they've been very welcoming. Yeah. Yeah, that's good. My younger son is um, a freeman of the Stationers Company. Um, but I think he, 
he was too old to get in the young stationers. I can't remember how old you have to be. Is it under 40? I believe so. Yes. Well, I think probably when he joined, he was just under 40, but he didn't get himself organised quickly enough. <laughs> um, now, you, this is this particular uh, conversation um, is going out just about at the time of the new year, Avianca. So what are your thoughts? I think, yes, I think, what are your thoughts about what would you like to see happen in the new year? Generally, but then also in relation to stationers, what, what might be your hopes for the new year? I'd hope that, um, particularly with the young stationers, we're able to, uh, you know, come together at some point and I guess reflect on this this year, 2020, and I guess just talk about maybe perhaps some of the challenges that any of us have gone through throughout the pandemic as well, and some of the positive things. I know speaking to some of the uh, people within the group, they've achieved some amazing things, and just celebrating those uh, that would be amazing to do. Yeah. Um, and yeah. in terms of the new year, I think just it has been a tough year, you know, 2020, and just keeping that optimism and that positive spirit that things would truly get better and just uh, looking forward. Yeah, I, I think we're all feeling that. And, you know, um, I, I'm feeling um, upbeat at the moment. I think that, you know, when we get into the new year, the vaccine gets rolled out and people then begin to see new opportunities you know, despite all of the difficulties that there have been. Um, and I'll tell you what we've a rather good fun thing to do. I've only just had this idea and I expect that uh, Deborah will have a heart failure. I think what we should try and arrange is sometime during next year, might even be after I've finished being the master, um, we ought to arrange a dinner to which we invite all of the people who are involved in these conversations I've had over the, over the whole of the year. Some of them, of course, are in the uh, USA and abroad, but uh, you never know, they might still be able to come by then. I hope you join us, would you? Most definitely. That would be amazing. That would be great. It'd be good, wouldn't it? Yes. Thank you very much. Sorry it's a slightly slow start because of uh, my timing and so on, but uh, as ever, it's always a joy to speak with you. I'll go away feeling better. <laughs> Thanks so way. much. Thank you. Thank you.